Um, as you can see by the title, uh, this is a, a Lifetime of Smiles Age One Dental Visit campaign. And what we hope with this educational experience to provide to other healthcare providers is that lifetime of a healthy oral mouth um, for children here in the Canton community. Uh, this is a partnership of a lot of groups um, and we've had financial support through the uh, American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the American Dental Association, the Health Fa Path Foundation of Ohio, as well as Delta Dental Foundation, the, the Ohio Department of Health, the Ohio Dental Association, the Children's Oral Health Action Team, and the Stark County Dental Society. Um, we've used educational materials from the Department of Health, um, Bureau of Oral Health Services, the AAPD, um, and uh, others. So the goal is to have um, a lifetime of smiles. Age One Dental Visit is a pediatric oral health program designed to educate the community and healthcare providers about the need for prevention rather than long-term treatment for oral health disease. We'll cover dental caries and early childhood caries. We'll do what the physical oral health assessment should be. We'll uh, go over anticipatory guidance and referral and then treatment and prevention. Um, so we'll start with dental caries and uh, early childhood caries. Tooth decay is the number one childhood illness in this country. It is five times more common than asthma and seven times more common than hay fever. So we classify um, early childhood caries as any decay in teeth under age six. Severe early childhood caries is defined as decay for any child younger than three. These are just some examples of what you would see as uh, decay in primary teeth and severe decay on the lower slide. Over 51 million school hours are lost yearly due to dental disease and dental pain. That amounts to over 2.2 million school days missed each year. Imagine how behind those children are when they can't uh, attend school. So what does early childhood caries cause? Pain, often, infection, not only of the teeth but of the jaws and face, difficulty with chewing and eating, sometimes weight uh, gain issues uh, and growth and development, as well as extensive and costly treatment um, when decay gets to this point. Obviously it leads to risk for decay in the adult dentition as well and oftentimes due to uh, spacing issues uh, from decay and lost teeth, we run into malocclusions and um, uh, possibility for braces. So who's at the greatest risk uh, for early childhood caries? We know um, that children from the lower socioeconomic groups, often those who are Medicaid eligible, and other ethnic cultural groups are more at risk. We know that children who have poor diets and uh, bad habits uh, when they eat or are being fed as uh, an infant also are at greater risk. Those who are not in fluoridated areas, whether due to well water or bottled water, also are at much greater risk. Those children whose parents or caregivers have had decay and or their siblings um, are at much greater risk. Obviously, children that where there are visible uh, areas of white spots or decay are at greater risk for continued and uh, advancing decay. And certainly, children who use sugar, whether that's in their diets or in many medications, uh, often uh, medications for young children are flavored, and those flavoring agents usually are high in sugar. Um, so chronic uh, asthma and other types of things with inhalers put at greater risk. And certainly, children with special health care needs are at risk as well. We know that the caries experience overall across the country is 37% uh, almost of children have caries in primary teeth. Um, you can see that it grows uh, with age. So youngsters before age five is in the 23% range and as we get into by age eight, uh, over 55% of children have decay. Those at greatest risk are outlined um, uh, in the ethno uh, uh, groups rather than whites uh, less uh, at risk. Untreated dental caries um, is, amounts to almost 15%, again, with greater risk in the other categories. So it is a huge problem, and as I said, is the number one um, childhood illness in the country. So why can't just dentists treat this problem, and why do we need other healthcare providers involved? Across the country, we know that uh, only 48% of children 
age one through 20 who are in Medicaid uh, coverage ever see the dentist for any type of dental treatment. Now the good news is over the last uh, decade we've seen that grow by over 60%. So uh, we're making advances and we hope to see that continue. We also know that that same cohort of uh, uh, patients aged one to 20 um, preventive dental care, are only seeing uh, a dentist for any type of preventive care 42% of the time, again, growing over the last decade. And finally, it's a much lower percentage of patients, only 23%, uh, who are actually getting some sort of dental treatment. So there is untreated disease that's still out there. And the dentist cannot be the only healthcare provider um, to manage this problem. And we know it is impossible to manage if it is caries have already occurred, you cannot treat your way out of this disease process. Prevention is the only thing that we can do. In Ohio specifically, those same uh, group of patients aged one to 20 who have been enrolled in Medicaid um, last or in fiscal year 2012, 41% uh, have received any type of dental care, 37% uh, receiving preventive care, and uh, about 17% receiving some sort of restorative care. So Ohio is behind the national average, and we hope to change that, at least here in our community. So what are the necessary factors to develop decay? Um, the primary ones are obviously a tooth. So once teeth erupt, usually beginning around age six months for uh, uh, young children, um, it is susceptible to decay. Obviously, we have to have some sort of flora, the bacteria um, that are in the mouth are what are necessary to cause the infectious process to lead to decay. And then you need a substrate, which generally is going to be some sort of carbohydrate that will be broken down um, into sucrose or glucose, which leads to acid production by the bacteria. But there's a much broader and wider range of socioeconomic factors that we know attribute as well. The home and oral uh, environment of the uh, parents and caregivers as well as siblings we know relate as well. We know children are born without bacteria in their mouth. They acquire their bacteria from their parents and or potentially siblings. So mothers or caregivers who blow on their food for their child to test it, or they take a bite off of the spoon um, before they feed it, or they possibly um, uh, touch or lick the nipple on a bottle uh, before giving it to the child or transferring their bacteria to their children. So if they've had decay or susceptible, we know we're passing that on. The anatomy of the tooth to demonstrate how decay can occur and what uh, the tooth looks like. The enamel is the outer layer, the hardest part of the tooth and the hardest part of our body. That's where the decay process begins uh, by demineralization from acid accumulation from the infectious bacterial process. Um, the remainder of the tooth, the inner part is the dent and it's much softer and then the pulp is the nerves and blood vessels that run into the tooth and the tooth is surrounded by gum and cover, or surrounded by bone and then covered by uh, the gum tissue, tissue. So what makes us susceptible? Again, obviously we have to have teeth, so starting at six months or when the first tooth erupts, um, there is susceptibility. How much fluoride, again, is in the uh, uh, drinking water of that patient as well as fluoridated toothpaste, again, will also um, uh, have determination. The development of the tooth or the morphology of the tooth, the, the crowding and occlusion of the tooth, um, if we can't adequately clean it, we're gonna be more susceptible if there's greater plaque accumulation, as well as that child's nutritional status and dietary habits. The presence of acid um, is caused by um, uh, foods as well as the bacterial uh, contamination and breakdown of carbohydrates into acid. So when we look at the pathogenesis of caries, there are billions of bacteria in the mouth naturally occurring, and many of those are necessary to start the digestive process, get the bolus of food ready to be swallowed and digested. But they become site spe they are site specific, and they become colonized only after the first tooth erupts. It is an infectious process, and it's initiated by the pathogenic bacteria that are in the mouth, primarily Streptococcus mutans. There will be bacterial growth once those colonies form, and uh, substrates are available such as carbohydrates uh, and particularly sugars, uh, sucrose and glucose. So cleaning the teeth is important to um, stop those initiating factors. And fluoride is the primary thing that will help prevent decay as the fluoride can accumulate in the plaque 
of the teeth and help remineralize teeth that have been demineralized. So how does the infection occur? Again, we get our bacteria primarily from our caregivers and mostly from uh, our mothers who have the closest bond to a child. That window of infectivity is in the first two years of life. Um, obviously, our bacteria change throughout our life. But the earlier the child is colonized and contaminated, especially with bacteria that um, lead to decay, um, the higher their risk for decay. So we do get it from our siblings as well as other family members by sharing of uh, utensils, toothbrushes, cups, things like that. So we want to try and minimize that, especially in the at-risk population. You are what you eat as we have lunch today. We see that. Um, but carbohydrates are the primary um, factors related to um, what will the bacteria use to break down into the acids. The acids themselves cause the demineralization of the enamel, and that will ultimately progress to the dentin and potentially the pulp, which can lead to uh, an abscess. The saliva in the mouth naturally buffers uh, those acids that are there. So patients who have a dry mouth, particularly young children who may be on medications um, that dry their mouth out, such as inhalers, are at um, much higher risk. Um, and also that is why it's important to brush before bedtime because we know the natural saliva flow decreases during the night and our mouth is drier. So when we want to remove that dental plaque um, that promotes caries process prior to bedtime and first thing in the morning. So we also know that that acid that's produced um, by the breakdown of carbohydrates by the strep mutans persists in the mouth for 20 to 40 minutes. Demineralization occurs below the critical pH of 5.5, and we know um, that each time you eat, uh, that occurs and it lasts for 20, 40 to minutes. So you're at risk for demineralization 20 to 40 minutes each time you consume or drink something other than water. Uh, so patients who sip or nibble or snack are much greater risk than those who have a dessert or a soft drink with their meal. Um, and that's an important lesson to make sure that, uh, that all care providers understand. Fluoride is the primary prevention um, uh, vehicle that we can use to decrease decay. It reduces the enamel solubility and actually remineralizes the enamel, which is composed of hydroxyl apatite. The fluoride ion is picked up um, by the uh, hydroxyl ion to uh, form fluorapatite, which is actually harder than the original enamel itself. So early caries that's demineralized and then remineralized with fluoride present actually makes a stronger tooth. But it also inhibits the cariogenic organisms, which will lead to decreases in acid production. The fluoride will concentrate in the dental plaque and can be taken up into the tooth um, when we use it topically as a varnish um, or in toothpaste. So we want to get fluoride to the teeth as early as we can and as often as we can. So we want fluoridated water, and if we don't have fluoridated water, we want to try and use supplements during the development of the teeth, and we want to make sure that fluoridated toothpaste is always used, and we want to use varnish on those patients that are at high risk for decay. Fluoride, what's the right amount? And uh, there's been some debate about that, but uh, the levels were just changed for water fluoridation. There used to be a range, but right now it's considered 0.7 parts per million or milligram per liter as the ideal optimal dose. And the reason we want to have an optimal dose is because we want to try and prevent fluorosis, which can occur if we have excess fluoride in the water. Um, the Ohio Department of Health can test and does have maps of where fluoride uh, concentration levels are throughout the entire state of Ohio, and uh, you can get on their website and look if your area is well water and you do not have city water. Most bottled water is not fluoridated, so um, we do see and uh, have seen increases in um, uh, decay rates uh, as bottled water has become more the norm. Fortunately, in Ohio, 91% of the population is covered by public water supplies, which are fluoridated. So young children who cannot um, spit and are more likely to swallow, we have to be cautious with their use of fluoride, and we want to minimize its use um, topically to where they're going to swallow it more than the optimum levels that they would get from toothpaste and uh, uh, fluoridated water. Uh, so we want to make sure that the swallowing uh, reflex is adequate before we're using um, uh, large amounts of fluoridated toothpaste. 
Um, and uh, really just a small pea size or literally grain of rice sized smear of toothpaste uh, on the toothbrush is adequate for young children, uh, primarily before the age of two or before they can adequately, adequately spit. The slide shows uh, what some mild fluorosis might look like. Usually it's gonna be a brownish pigmentation in the tooth. That tooth will be uh, much harder uh, than a normal tooth and it will be much less susceptible to decay, uh, but it's unsightly nonetheless, particularly uh, when it's the anterior teeth. We can also see some whitish hypoplastic areas on the, the teeth that may be related to fluorosis as well. Once the permanent teeth have erupted between age six and eight, the risk for fluorosis disappears as that enamel is already fully developed. Topical fluorides are not gonna cause fluorosis. It's what we ingest that is gonna to lead to the fluorosis. So it is a problem that we have to be concerned with with youngsters, and that is when they're at most risk because they can't swallow if we're using fluoridated toothpaste. So we'll go into the oral health assessment and the screening. It's a simple process that any individual can do. You don't have to be a dentist. Um, any health care provider using the, the, the parent or caregiver um, can do an oral exam um, easily by positioning themselves in a chair um, with the child on their lap and generally with the child's uh, legs wrapped around the waist of the care provider, sitting in a knee-to-knee -knee position, um, uh, tipping the child back and uh, simply observing the teeth, hopefully with adequate light. Um, uh, if the child cries, that's perfectly normal. You would expect a young child, especially an infant before age one, to do that. Um, but it's a perfect way to be able to see um, their entire mouth very easily. So don't be upset if a child's crying when you're doing it. Um, this assessment is really to, to see and understand what normal uh, teeth look like and if there is a suspicion of disease to refer them uh, to a dentist. Um, so we want to also educate the parents or caregivers about why we need the exam because it's important we prevent um, decay rather than try and treat it because once we have developed decay, we set up bacteria that are acidophilic and that patient is more susceptible throughout their entire life. Uh, so we want to uh, absolutely uh, start with prevention and the parents and caregivers are the ones who need to know and understand um, why it's so important. So these are what healthy teeth look like. We all know we should have kind of milky white enamel. Uh, there should be pink healthy gum tissue that's scalloped and surrounds the tooth. The teeth should occlude or come together in a normal fashion as you see uh, on the screen. Um, excess spacing is always a good thing because it makes it a little easier for the kids to uh, uh, get in and clean. Here's what we see when we see beginning demineralization or decay process starting. We see white spots on the teeth and that is where that um, kind of enamel that's uh, milky white starts to get very white in color. And it's usually gonna occur near the gum line because that's where the plaque accumulates and where the brushing is the most um, difficult and uh, hardest to remove. When we see these white spot lesions, um, this is reversible at this point and with fluoride varnish, good brushing, topical application simply with fluoride toothpaste, um, we can halt this process and keep it from progressing. Um, these lesions are becoming a little more advanced um, and as we see on the lateral incisor, it's actually cavitated. That whitish halo now has kind of a golden amber uh, color that is beginning or incipient decay. Um, fluoride varnish may reverse this process or at least um, minimize its advancement. So in a young patient who uh, uh, treatment may be difficult due to cooperation, at a minimum fluoride varnish uh, can be put over the, these areas and uh, uh, hopefully impede its progression with good or better home care um, in the future. So these areas of white spots can decay um, further and lead to uh, cavitation of the tooth um, which will be seen as a much darker area in the tooth. Uh, often the white spot will be eliminated completely and you'll see darkness. Um, that penetration within the, the smooth surface of the facial areas of the teeth or on the biting surfaces or occlusal surfaces will look dark and actually often will have a hole present. That needs intervention and treatment by a dentist and referral.
these brown spot lesions, again, are a sign that the dentin has likely been uh, invaded and it's broken through the enamel. This will require uh, surgical intervention and repair with restoration. Fluoride application is still appropriate uh, even on these advanced cases as it may retard the progression. These are areas of obvious advanced and severe decay that will only be able to be treated by extraction uh, in general. And extraction of the primary teeth is or potentially can be a problem for growth and development of the maxilla, premaxilla, and occlusion and may lead to orthodontic problems later in life. But it's imperative to remove these teeth as if not, um, you can end up with a facial cellulitis and a life-threatening infection for uh, this young child. Um, this could all be prevented, and that's our goal. So what do we want to do for um, care providers and uh, uh, parents? We want to try and anticipate what problems that they might have with their children in the future. So we want to give them the information before problems develop. Um, it's too late when we have cases that are on those last sides. So we want to minimize the risk for that child's infection, and how do we do that? Here are the things not to do that parents just may not understand if we don't educate them. Don't clean the baby's pacifier with your own mouth. You're transferring your saliva to that child. Don't share cups or bottles with your children at, at any age, but particularly at younger ages when their mouths have not been colonized by bacteria. And particularly if a caregiver or provider has had a history of uh, poor oral health and a lot of uh, periodontal or disease or decay themselves. Don't share utensils when you eat, and don't share toothbrushes. Um, practice good oral, oral hygiene. Brush twice a day for two minutes, preferably morning and afternoon. And if you can brush uh, or rinse after meals, um, that's equally important. But if we remove that plaque and disrupt it twice a day, uh, we're generally going to minimize or eliminate the problems. If the, afraid, uh, the bristles are frayed on the toothbrush, throw it away and get a new one. It won't be adequately removing that plaque off the teeth if it's not uh, uh, good firm uh, bristles on a soft toothbrush. If the child hasn't ha had their teeth erupt yet, um, wipe their gums after meals uh, with a wet uh, washcloth. That will at least clean the food out and get that child used to um, having uh, their mouth touched in the areas of their teeth and get them used to when you're ready to brush. Xylitol gum may be helpful for mothers who have had poor oral health and are at high risk of transferring bacteria to their children as we know xylitol gum can inactivate and it has a bacteriostatic effect on strep mutans and so it may minimize the bacteria in the mother's mouth um, that they might pass on to their children. What else do we want to let them know? We want to make sure that they reduce the dietary sugars for their children, particularly for their oral health, but also um, for uh, minimizing childhood obesity as well as childhood diabetes. They have common factors and uh, sugar frequency and intake is, is one of them. Never put a child to bed with a bottle or to sleep with a bottle for a nap. Even a sippy cup is bad because they can constantly do it. So as soon as they can possibly get the lid off that cup without having to have uh, carpet cleaners or upholstery cleaners in the house every day, um, do so because they won't be able to suck on it all the time. Remember that 20 to 40 minute acid exposure each time you do something other than water. If it's water, fine, it's hydrating uh, as well as uh, its neutral pH. So a pacifier should never be dipped in anything sugary. That seems tempting and uh, soothing, but please, uh, we want to avoid those things. And then fluoride whenever we can. Obviously, on the toothbrush, um, for brushing the teeth, especially as the children get older and can um, uh, spit uh, on their own. So recommendations for brushing, again, we need to assist children probably until age 10 or 12 with their brushing. At least it should be supervised. But particularly patients uh, who are um, below age two or three, the parent or caregiver has to brush their teeth for them. Um, anyone that has children uh, knows that uh, the brushing occurs on the central incisors pretty darn good, um, but the back teeth never quite get reached. So we want to teach uh, a methodic pattern of brushing and making sure we reach all su surfaces of the teeth um, using a modified uh, bass technique of holding the toothbrush 
partially on the gum and partially on the tooth at a 45 degree angle and working it back and forth. You can use circular motions up and down, anything that gets that toothbrush against the teeth. But again, we need fluoride uh, as soon as we can possibly have there and as often as we possibly can. So what are the acids uh, and acidic levels of some of the things that we consume daily and we never even think about? How often would anyone take battery acid and pour it in their mouth? I don't think anyone would, and if you got any on your skin, you'd flush it away immediately. We understand the significance of that and how uh, 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 damaging that might be. Uh, but all of these products are pretty close um, to the acidity of battery acid. With that comes a high content of sugar um, that's not only not healthy, but is the perfect substrate for the strep mutans to use to produce even more acids. So it's not just uh, the pH level, but the titratable acidity. Certain things we know tend to be worse clinically than others. Um, and that is uh, things such as Mountain Dew, Gatorade, and Red Bull. But Gatorade and Red Bull particularly have a very high titratable acid. So it's much more available for demineralization and erosion. Red Bull is three times higher than Coke. So you see these kids that are on these energy drinks, they're very, very damaging uh, to the teeth. And even things we might consider healthy, cranberry juice, Capri Sun, um, which has a straw in it that we suck on you know, uh, continuously, or Gatorade that we use for many of our high school uh, athletes um, to use is very uh, low pH, high acid content with a lot of sugar. So where's milk? Not bad, but it still contains sugar. Um, pH is pretty good, water's the best, obviously. So water is what we wanna use, and pre uh, preferentially, we wanna use water with fluoride. Um, again, xylitol gum may be beneficial as well. So um, the party line. Every organized dental institution says children should have a dental evaluation and exam by age one. Um, the problem is that doesn't frequently happen. A recent study just published at the end of last year um, uh, showed that children seen after age four had an average of 3.58 more dental procedures and spent on average $360 more over the uh, next eight years of their life than those children who had an exam prior to age four. So the data is irrefutable. The earlier you start, the better uh, oral health that child would have, will have throughout their life and the less cost and the less treatment that they will need. Here's the problem. Only 3% of Ohio Medicaid eligible children under the age of three received any dental services through the early periodic screening, diagnosis, and treatment programs that are mandatory under Medicaid. Medicaid has a requirement in an attempt to treat problems before they become permanent lifelong disabilities that um, children are seen at an early age for their overall health. Oral health should always be a part of that, but it hasn't been in the past. Only 8% of general dentists in Ohio recommend the first dental visit by age one. There may be a reason for that, however, when you survey, um, because the population that many dentists see in suburban communities, um, their parents come every six months. They have healthy mouths. Their children generally socioeconomically are not as at high risk, and most of those children oftentimes have seen between age two and three when all the primary teeth have erupted, generally are still not gonna have problems. Um, but a, uh, a segment of the population uh, at age one, it's absolutely essential and every child will benefit from a, a, a dental visit uh, at age one or after the first tooth erupts. And it's a simple, easy exam to do. The other problem is a lot of general dentists just aren't comfortable treating children. And there are only about 140 pediatric dentists in the state of Ohio. So there aren't a lot of areas to refer them uh, if they need advanced care. Thankfully, Mercy Medical Center has uh, the facility, the knowledge, the expertise, and the opportunity to treat these children. And so where can healthcare providers refer them? Obviously, pediatric dentists. Obviously, children's hospitals who have uh, pediatric dental residency programs uh, but also hospitals that have um, general practice residency programs such as Mercy, 
um, and other saf safety net dental clinics. Um, many general dentists do see children, and so hopefully by word of mouth, uh, many patients or their families can find um, those people. So what are we going to do for prevention? Again, fluoride is the number one thing that we can do to prevent decay. These are, this table shows what um, supplements you might use if the child's uh, fluoride um, that their intake is, if they don't have fluoridated water and it's below 0.6 part per million, um, you would be recommending up to one milligram uh, uh, per um, uh, supplement uh, for that child. But this chart's easy to follow. Thankfully, most children will not need supplements, and the supplements are really only necessary um, through the teenage years as enamel is developed, and topical fluoride is much more um, necessary for prevention at, at those ages. So we only want to use supplements um, to, uh, for children who do not receive the optimum fluoridated um, water supply, and uh, they come in multi uh, uh, multiple forms, but the easiest usually is multivitamins with fluoride in a chewable format. They come in one, millimeter, or one milligram, 0.5 milligrams, and 0.25 milligram dosages, again, depending what their uh, uh, fluoride concentration may already be, or they do come in drops for uh, children who uh, uh, are very young and need a supplement in a 0.25 milligram once daily. What are the other sources of fluoride? Topical fluoride, again, becomes the most important as the teeth are erupted and the enamel is formed. Fluoride varnish is the most highly concentrated and best way to apply fluoride. 5% uh, sodium fluoride amounts to 22,500 parts per million fluoride. Uh, so when we think 0.7 is what we want in a water supply, um, this is high concentration that, again, is applied directly to the tooth. Acidulated phosphate fluoride, or APF, is a 1.23% uh, concentration and again amounts to about 12,500 parts per million. So what are the brands out there? Colgate has a varnish um, Prevident and they have a toothpaste uh, Prevident 5000, which is by prescription, but that's 5,000 parts per million. Um, and uh, 3M SB has a varnish again with 5% sodium fluoride. It also has tricalcium uh, phosphate, which is a remineralizing agent as well. And then they have ClinPro 5000 again. Uh, a, uh, a prescription toothpaste. Nupro also has a uh, sodium fluoride 5% varnish as well. To apply the fluoride varnish, again, you would use the exact same position that you did to do the exam and at the exact same time, you just simply slop or paint the fluoride on with a brush. Um, anywhere you get it on the teeth after drying them off, it doesn't matter if there's plaque there, the plaque will absorb it and that fluoride still be, will be used to remineralize. Um, the tooth. There are insurance reimbursement and codes through Medicaid um, for application. What are some other sources that we can use to help uh, remineralize teeth? There are a number of others. None will be as beneficial as fluoride, but these can help uh, in addition. Recalden is one. It's got casein, phosphopeptides, and amorphous calcium phosphate. Both of those um, uh, provide more available calcium and phosphates in the saliva which can be used to remineralize uh, decalcifications in the tooth. Trident Extra Care uh, housed the Recaldent in it, as does MI paste, which would be prescribed by dentists uh, or physicians for home use. Xylitol is another um, agent that is used. It's actually an artificial sweetener. Um, we can find it in uh, uh, many things, but it needs to be one of the first two ingredients when you look on a label for it to be therapeutic um, uh, effect to actually help uh, remineralization as well as um, uh, the bacteriostatic effect on strep mutants. So fluoride helps by bacteriostatic effect um, and primarily by remineralization. Xylitol um, really helps in the bacteriostatic effect against strep mutant. There were several studies done in the past. They mostly were overseas. Xylitol just has not caught on in the United States. Um, but uh, we have seen up to 70% reduction in caries, which lasted over five years from simply chewing xylitol gum uh, for children. Children of mothers who chewed xylitol gum had 70% fewer cavities. 
um, uh, just simply by, again, the mother not transferring her bacteria to their child. Again, that had a lasting effect in the child, even though the child may not have chewed the gum themselves. So if you are going to chew gum or your patients are going to do it, and that is a very healthy habit if it's done in moderation because it stimulates salivary flow, which has a natural buffering effect, but also it can be bacteriostatic against the bacteria that cause tooth decay. So chew it, uh, one of the little ice cubes, xylitol gum comes in many forms, but the one that is most commonly available is put out by Hershey of all people, uh, chocolate and then gum. Uh, so icebreakers or ice cubes are the best one and most commonly there. Many others can be found uh, on the internet. Uh, chew a little uh, cube uh, three to five times daily, five minutes. That's all you need and you're not going to develop TMJ or other problems from it. So in summary, we can uh, impact uh, the most prevalent childhood disease that we see by simple um, uh, preventive measures. Uh, we need to do it, particularly with the high-risk populations that we see, and we need help from our other health care providers. So we need to collaboratively work as dentists, pediatricians, and family practice uh, physicians to do a dental exam by the child's first birthday, to educate the parents and guardians about proper nutrition and oral hygiene, to refer cases where there is decay to appropriate um, dentists who can take care of that care, and to make sure that those patients are receiving uh, proper fluoride uh, supplements and applying fluoride varnish whenever we see them.